Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. On October 14th, 1878, Thomas Edison filed his first patent for the light bulb. However, this was only a patent for an improvement in electric lights. For you see, many people nowadays still give Thomas Edison credit for inventing the light bulb because that's the story that we remember and we heard growing up. Technically, the first electric light was invented by Humphrey Davy more than 70 years before Edison's patent. This is what myths and urban legends are made of, and they can leave us with a cloud over history. An urban legend at the NFL level is uncovered in this week's episode, and it all revolves around a game where the loser is told they can get out. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is November 25th, 1920, and we are in Chicago, Illinois, the Windy City, an epicenter of football during the early years. We are here for a game between the Chicago Tigers and the Chicago Cardinals. Or was it? Are we really here? Do we really come to the right spot in time? Because is there really a game going on on November 25th, 1920, Thanksgiving Day, Chicago, Illinois, Windy City, between the Chicago Tigers and the Chicago Cardinals? Well, I don't know. But what we do know is over on the East Coast, in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, the epicenter of the first organized Thanksgiving Day parade. But it wasn't Macy's. It was Gimble Brothers. We remember today of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parades. We just assume often that that was how it always was. But that was not the case. Back then, it was the Gimble Brothers that started this whole tradition. And in 1920, there's NFL types of controversies that who knows what really went on. Controversies galore. Settle this once and for all is what we want to do. We want to bring back a special guest to ride shotgun with us to really talk about that supposed game between the Chicago Tigers and the Chicago Cardinals where if you lose, then you're kicked out of the city, man. Pack your bags. Don't let the door hit you when you go. That kind of thing. But let's bring him back. This guy, we remember him. He talked about the Chicago Cardinals a few, eh, about six or seven episodes ago. His name is Joe Ziemba. And if that name does sound familiar, well, like I said, we talked about him and we interviewed him in episodes 87 and 88 to discuss the early years of the Chicago Cardinals. Now, the Arizona Cardinals. I'll go ahead and put links to the different episodes and his bio page in the show notes for you. And uh, well, by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes, well, each and every week. But let's get back to this week's episode, where we're going to talk about not the Chicago Cardinals, we're going to talk about the Chicago Tigers. But as a refresher for you, Joe Ziamba, He's a resident Chicago Cardinals expert and Chicago early history football guru in general. He's a speaker and author. Now he's a podcast superstar for the football history dude. He has two books. The first one is called When Football Was Football, The Chicago Cardinals and the Birth of the NFL. The other one is about high school. It's called Cadets, Cannons, and Legends, The Football History of Morgan Park Military Academy. But this time, we're going to ask him to come by the show 
We're going to hop on this DeLorean, take it up to 88 miles an hour, and we're going to fill in the gaps of the Chicago Tigers. So without further ado, welcome back, Joe Ziemba. Joe, welcome back to the Football History Do Podcast. We are so happy to be here. Thank you very much for having us again, and we'd love to discuss the old-time football games. Oh, sure, sure. And speaking of the old football time games, let's uh, let's kind of set the record straight on something. It's a controversy that I've seen throughout different websites than even the NFL and Professional Football Hall of Fame's website. Let's talk about that game, or maybe not game, I don't know, the game of the Chicago Tigers and the Chicago Cardinals, the whole settle the score game, you lose and you're out of here, pack your bags kind of game. Let's start there. What really happened with that game? That game did occur, and the Cardinals did win. But what's interesting is that the alleged challenge that the Cardinals owner, Chris O'Brien, put down to Gil Falcon, who was the manager of the Chicago Tigers. The Cardinals were on the south side of Chicago playing at Normal Park, and the Tigers had taken over Cubs Park, which is now known as Wrigley Field, in 1920. And supposedly, O'Brien challenged the Tigers to one final game and the winner take all. In other words, the losing team would have to give up its franchise and go away forever. So it took a while to figure this one out. During my research of the Cardinals over the last couple of decades, I've never been able to find anything in any of the Cardinals' history that could support that statement. But I've always wondered, where the heck did it come from? Because if you look at different websites that are knowledgeable and trustworthy, they'll talk about this game and how the Cardinals survived and even what would have happened to today's Cardinals if they had lost that game back in 1920 and be forced to disband, so to speak. It wasn't until I was looking through some Cardinals programs from the early 50s, and this is after the original owner, Chris O'Brien, passed away, that I saw an article by the uh, PR department of the Cardinals which mentioned that game and said that rumor has it or legend has it that the Cardinals got their start back in 1920 when they uh, challenged the Tigers to a game and the Cardinals won, the Tigers went away, which they did after a year, but not for that reason. But there was nothing to support it. It did not appear until after Chris O'Brien passed away and the uh, PR guy of the Cardinals was named Eddie McGuire. And Eddie was known to stretch the truth once in a while. So I'm going to give Eddie credit for starting this in about 1954 or 55, and it's been picked up ever since. Uh, It's one of those, I guess, urban legends that never occurred. The two teams did play, but when the Tigers disbanded, it was from probably lack of money uh, rather than being on the losing end of a game with the Cardinals, which the Cardinals did win when Petty Driscoll scored the only touchdown of the game. Yeah, it's funny how urban legends can start and grow and become, in many people's minds, the truth. And this is just one example. It certainly is because even nowadays, I'll see articles that that talk about this, the game that was or wasn't and uh, back in 1920 between these two teams. So it's kind of taken a life of its own. And I guess like other urban legends, until you kind of have the uh, ability to get out there and find the truth, they keep reproducing and we keep reading about it. But in my opinion, never occurred. It kind of reminds me of uh, old time war where the uh, history is written by the victors. And I guess this goes back to it. The uh, PR guy for the Cardinals was able to write the history. He certainly was. And uh, this is where a lot of uh, the things about the Cardinals early days that we talked about previously began too, as to when the team actually started, who owned it. And, uh, Etc. So there's been some tall tales that came out from the Cardinals themselves, which we've now been able to prove uh, did not exist. So we've got this game, and we we know that the Tigers ended up being kicked at, well, not kicked out of league because of this game, but because of probably lack of money and operational value. But how did they start? Let's go back to the more the beginning of the Chicago Tigers. What's their origin story? To go back to the beginning of the Tigers, we really need to start with the 1919 Hammond Pros, also called the Hammond All-Stars out of Hammond, Indiana. This was, of course, before the uh, early days of what we knew as the American Professional Football Association, which then became the, the NFL. But the owner of the Hammond Pros, a guy named Paul Pardoon, I believe if I'm pronouncing that correctly, 
was very active in recruiting the top players in the Midwest to come play for his team. And they were quite successful as a team. They they rented out Cubs Park again, now known as Wrigley Field, played their home games there because they didn't have a stadium that was sufficient to hold large crowds in Hammond, Indiana. So they had some great players on that team. Uh, foremost, George Ellis, uh, founded the Bears, Patty Driscoll, the Hall of Famer for the Cardinals, but also four or five other players that became the Chicago Tigers. So I think from that, that Hammond pros team, and Hammond did survive into 1920 and played into the mid-20s, but under a completely revamped roster in 1920. The 1919 team was known as the $20,000 team, probably an exaggeration of how much the owner actually paid the players, but in George Hallis's autobiography, he mentions that he had this nice job as an engineer in, in the Chicago area for $65 a week, I believe. And he found out that the, the Hammond pros in 1919 were paying $100 a game for their players. So he snapped up that opportunity, as did Patty Driscoll and several others, to become a member of, of Hammond. Towards the end of the season, though, uh, Hammond was having some difficulties paying their bills. And one of those unique stories of early pro football history was two of the players sued, I shouldn't say sued, but had the owner arrested because their checks bounced. <laughs> and so he actually got arrested, and uh, these are two of the guys who actually started the Chicago Tigers a year later. And so there are three people who played for Hammond. Gil Falcon was one, another guy named Milt G, and then a guy named Desjard- a Shorty Desjardins who played at the University of Chicago. So these were all well-known players, and when that version of the Hammond team disbanded, uh, a few of the players stayed for the 1920 version. But several players went with uh, the Tigers, I think five or six of them, and then several went with George Hellas to form the Decatur Staley's down in Decatur, Illinois. Back when the Staley's and the Tigers played later, supposedly for the championship of the Midwest Professional League, uh, there was about 11 or 12 players in that game who played for the Hammond Pros in 1919. So the Tigers evolved then from 1919 and Hammond. A guy named Gil Falcon, who was a player coach, was credited as being the manager. And then we had also Mil G and uh, Shorty Desjardins, who were the other two key guys. So three of them formed the team. And they had some help from a guy named uh, Rube Cook. Rube worked for the Chicago Cubs, and he was able to get the Tigers into Cubs Park to play their home games. So that's where they played. And those three guys kind of got it started recruiting players. And then Rube Cook, took care of the financial end of it for the team. So speaking of the financial end of it, and that's believed to be the reason why they ended up faltering, why do you think that it was the Cardinals ultimately that won the city, you know, before the Decatur Staley's turned into the Bears? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, We don't see anything in the newspapers or the history books about why the, the Tigers went away. So it's very easy to say, well, they lost the bet and they're gone. But uh, they had one game that drew fairly well, and that was with the Staley's. It was originally supposed to be down in Decatur. This was right after the Staley's drew about 1,500 people to their game with Kwani, Illinois, believe it or not. And so they thought they could draw a bigger crowd in Chicago by having uh, playing at the Tigers. Uh, so it just seems that except for that one game, the crowds were not very large. If they had to pay rent on the stadium as well as pay the players, there really wasn't much to go around. So a lot of the players continued playing, but it was probably just another one of those examples of the early teams who just did not have the financial backing. These were players who were kind of owning and organizing the team, and they didn't have the deep pockets, uh, whereas the Staley said had the uh, backing of the Staley Manufacturing Company. The Cardinals also relied on a lot of local investors in those early days, and Chris O'Brien had a nice sweetheart deal to use normal park. So there wasn't a lot of stands in terms of rooms for attendance, but they were drawing good crowds, if not huge crowds, in order to be able to pay the bills and continue onward, where the Tigers probably paid a little more to rent Cubs Park and uh, found that money was a little short. In fact, their season only consisted of eight games. They were two, five, and one that, that year in 1920. And then they went away forever, but likely because of financial difficulties or challenges. And was part of it due to not being able to keep the star players as far as the uh, record, you think? 
Yeah, they had uh, some good players, but at that time with the the NFL as we knew it, be kind of taking those infant steps. There was a lot of uh, game-to-game negotiations with big players that we saw. Uh, even the Cardinals or the Staleys would add a player during the season, but we didn't see that really with the Tigers. So they had their core players. Uh, Shorty Desjardins uh, was a two-time All-American from the University of Chicago back when that school was a powerhouse. And Dartmouth uh, gave us another All-American in Mil G, their quarterback. Uh, but for most of it, they were local players. Um, I think a couple of them, well, Johnny Barrett, who was from Washington and Lee, and, and Milt G were both from Oak Park, Illinois. Shorty Desjardins was from Chicago. They, so they tended to recruit locally. If they could find someone from a bigger school, they would go after them. But they really didn't seem to have the resources to attract the real big stars. I wonder if Just say everything was on a level playing field as far as finances, the Tigers, the Cardinals, and the Staleys. I wonder if the Tigers and Cardinals would have been the teams that stayed in Chicago and then we never ended up with the Chicago Bears ultimately. Yeah, that's an interesting concept because early in the season, the Tigers were, at least in the Chicago papers, were predicted to have the strongest team because of these couple of All-Americans they had. And Interesting aspect of that so-called bet between the Cardinals and the Tigers is that if the Tigers did leave, why did Chris O'Brien allow the Bears to come in or the Staleys the following year and take over Wrigley Field? But yeah, if they if they had the same finances, I think we would have seen the Tigers on the north side remaining there. They were there first. They were there before the Staleys, and we would have the Cardinals on the south side, probably both supported by a very loyal rooting base on both sides of the city. So. I think that's a very good observation that if there was equal financial footing, we might still be cheering for the Chicago Tigers today. Well, then that even begs the other question, would say we flash forward to when the Cardinals moved to St. Louis and now Arizona, would it have possibly been the Cardinals staying in Chicago and then the Tigers moving on to some other city? Yeah, that, that's a possibility as well. I wish we had that old uh, crystal ball to gaze into a little bit, but yeah, the the Cardinals, who knows, may have gotten a uh, a little stronger financially as the years went by because the Bears were easily, easily the more popular the pro teams in terms of the fan attendance at the time. And and that's when they relied solely on the attendance and what little advertising they could generate. So it could have been, yeah, that the Cardinals would have been the kings of Chicago if that uh, scenario played out. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we'll never see. We'll never know. I mean, I always talk about heading back in my DeLorean. Maybe we can tweak yes. a few things. You'll have to take a ride back and let us know how it might have worked out. Right, yeah. But then I might end up in one of those time continuums and coming back and I don't know. <laughs> all of a sudden, I meet my grandpa and things go haywire. But yeah, so I mean, anything else as far as the Tigers history goes that you've seen throughout your experiences or your research? Yeah, it just seemed the Tigers had a really solid team, and things seemed to fall apart after a strong start when they were scheduled to to meet the Staleys. As I mentioned, it was uh, self-anointed to be for the championship of the Midwest of the professional teams. And so the, the Tigers were well-respected. They had a, a nice lineup. The Bears, of course, were just beginning as well as the Staleys. So I think the the team itself was pretty strong. I guess the only thing that I'm really confident about is that bet never occurred between the Cardinals and the Tigers. And so we uh, we had both teams, at least until the end of the 1920 season. Another irony is that if the Cardinals did have that bet with the Tigers, why did the Tigers still have two more games after that contest? So it, it continued on. So it's just another one of those urban legends, a nice team that was there at the start of uh, professional football in America, and another team that we'll probably miss and continue to tell stories about. Right, yeah. It's just another one of those, like you said, urban legends. It's uh, up for debate. Sports people love to debate about topics, and another reason why the NFL, the current NFL, is really the most popular sport in America, marketing and telling stories about how we got to where we are. We're in the 100th season, and Never going to know what would have happened to the Tigers, but what we can know is what's going to happen moving forward. So uh, I really appreciate your time, Joe. Anything that you have left for us? I mean, 
I, I've already talked about your books, and we're going to be leaving the links to your books again on the show notes. Um, I've seen recently you've been talking about the Cadets book. you have any updates on that one? Yeah, Cadets book is interesting because this is the book about the football history program of Morgan Park Military Academy, which a school that is no longer a military academy but still proudly exists on the south side of Chicago. It's not played a football game in over 40 years, but recently the uh, uh, one of the research in the state of Illinois has uh, added those records to uh, the all-time records of high schools in Illinois and puts them among the top with uh, over 400 victories, even though they haven't played a game in, in f- over 40 years. So it's uh, <laughs> wow. It's always fun to talk about them and uh, some of the players. For example, uh, we may have mentioned Jess Harper, who became the coach at Notre Dame and before Rockney. Rockney was one of his players. Well, he was kind of a uh, not a good, strong player at the University of Chicago, but he was an entrepreneur. And while on the bench at the University of Chicago, he made a ton of money by organizing hot dog sales in the stands. That you could get them for ten cents a piece or two for a quarter if you wanted the express service. So we have one of our great football legends in the College Football Hall of Fame and the legendary Notre Dame coach who made his early earnings by selling hot dogs while sitting on the bench at a football game. Well, I bet that's just two of many other interesting stories about the deep history of that school. Yeah. And one other thing about the Tigers is, uh, which I didn't know, is Mill G, their five foot seven quarterback from Dartmouth. As I mentioned, he was an All American, but when he was uh, playing pro ball, I believe for Canton in 1917, Sports Illustrated did an article years ago and credited with Mill G and Greasy Neal, who later became the coach of the Eagles, with using the very first huddle during a game in 1917. And uh, that was an interesting story, I thought. So if we have anything left from the Chicago Tigers, it's that Milt G probably gave us the huddle huh. that we still see in most every game in pro football and college. Wow, yeah. I, I've not even seen that before in any of my research. Uh, makes me wonder what goes through people's minds when they create these different methods to like the huddle or even the, yeah. the forward pass and anything like that. Exactly. All these little stories that are out there just waiting for us to discover. And speaking of that, uh, if anybody wants to check out more on you or your books, where is the best place to go for them? We do have a Facebook page, which uh, is, uh, I guess, uh, focused on the Chicago Cardinals. So just go to facebook.com, Chicago Cards, and uh, we have postings there almost every day. Right now, we're complaining about Patty Driscoll not being... Uh, one of the finalists for the all-time team of the NFL as in the backfield, even though he was eight times All-Pro in the 1920s. And that followed my rant on why Duke Slater is not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, even though he was several years All-Pro in the 20s and early 30s. We get into things like that about the old players, but uh, that's the best place. And of course, feel free to contact me through that page, and we always get back to people very quickly. And we're also on Twitter, at Cards Chicago. All right. Well, Joe, thanks for stopping by on the DeLorean again. Ryan Shotgun, this time talking about the Chicago Tigers and a little bit more history about the Cardinals. Uh, anything you have left for the fans of the show? No, we uh, we thank you again for bringing this history back to life, so to speak, and uh, congratulate you and applaud you for the job you're doing and not forgetting these great, great football players that time has almost forgotten. So thank you very much for having me. All right. Thanks, Joe. Well, I'm going to crank this baby up to 88 miles an hour. I'm going to (laughs) go explore some other point in time in history. So have yourself a wonderful night. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Well, there you go. Another urban legend debunked. And how about Joe Ziemba stopping by the show again? I mean, this dude is such a wealth of knowledge of the Chicago Cardinals, but not just stopping there, just early professional football history in general. If you want to know more about him, he gave you many places where you can go. Make it easier. Like I said, I'll leave some links in the show notes for you. But I do hope that you enjoyed Joe stopping by again and, you know, dropping some of these great iron knowledge nuggets all over the place for us. If you like the episode, though, I ask that you please go ahead and share it with at least one more football geek such as yourself. Because speaking of football geeks, next week's episode releases on Christmas Day. So I'm going to give you a present. Well, We get to give me a present, too, because I'm a Detroit Lions fan. We're going to hear from Gene Cronin. He was a defensive end during the 1950s, the late 50s, and the early 1960s. 
But the thing that's cool for me, and many of you two out there, is that my present is Gene played on the 1957 Detroit Lions championship team. The last team that my Lions took down the crowd. And it's not going to happen this year. So, my consolation prize, we're going to talk to Gene Cronin to talk about what it was like playing for the 1957 Detroit Lions championship team. But we'll get into that next week. Because for now, dudes, I'll tell you what. I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.